different people's encounters with enlightenment, enlightenment in the form of the, the Buddha, the historical Buddha. So these are stories from the Pali Canon. So we'll be looking at what he had to say to each of these very different people. And we'll also be um, bringing out, uh, as, we, as we give the talks, uh, what the Buddha might say to us here and now. Um, how are these teachings relevant to us? And of course, each of us might also be asking, well, how, how is this teaching relevant to me? What would the Buddha be saying to me personally? Um, so our first story in this series um, comes from a sutta called, a discourse called the Honeyball Sutta, a discourse on the honeyball. Um, so a honeyball, I, I take it that this probably refers to a, a wild bee's nest because they're round and they're full of honey. Uh, I can't imagine how else you get a honeyball, uh, but this is not a sutta about beekeeping. Um, it's called the Honeyball Sutta because when the bhikkhus who hear this discourse finally um, really understand what the Buddha was saying, they exclaim, that is as sweet as a ball of honey. But actually the person who had this encounter with the Buddha, um, who received this teaching, didn't find this teaching all that, all that sweet. In fact, he found it had a sting in, his, in its tail, uh, which he didn't like all that much. Um, as we'll see. So the sutta starts off with an encounter between the Buddha and a certain Dandapani, which means stick in hand, um, holding a stick. And um, so Dandapani, we're told, likes walking around. He likes roaming around. Um, and so he's stomping around with his walking stick in his hand. Um, and he, when he comes across the Buddha, he comes across the Buddha and a number of his followers in a clearing in the great forest. Uh, um, um, now, whoever recorded this sutta, uh, if they'd lived in our time, I think they could have had a successful career as a writer of short stories because in just a few strokes of the verbal brush, and without actually literally saying Dandapani's like this and Dandapani's like that, they give us a really clear sketch of Dandapani. We get a really clear, vivid picture of Dandapani. Um, so for a start, there is his name, Dandapani, stick in hand, holding a stick. Well. That can't have been his real name, surely. I mean, I mean, it's called Stick in Hand, holding a stick. It could have been a nickname. It could possibly have been a nickname. But I think much more likely it's a name chosen by whoever recorded this sutta to tell us something about Dandapani. Um, so we're told he liked uh, roaming around. And we can imagine him ro stomping around with his stick um, on his walks. Um, from the walking stick um, and him stomping around on his walks, we can imagine a vigorous old man, somebody getting on in years a bit. Um, otherwise, why the walking stick? Uh, going about with his walking stick. And then, um, well, as well, as well as being sort of supports when we walk around, sticks are things we can lash out with. We can clear things out of our way. We can knock down any plants by the side of the path. A dog comes, we can get away. We could even threaten or even lash out or point it at people we don't like. Um, so there's that about sticks as well. Um, somebody annoys us, uh, a stick. So first of all, there is his name. His very name tells us something about Dandapani. Um, but then also, the only thing, we're not, he doesn't, there's not much description of his appearance, but the only thing that's said about him is describing a frown. Um, his, his brow is furrowed, lots of furrows on his brow. So he's frowning. Um, we see him frowning, displeased. So that's two things about him. Um, his walking his stick and his frown. And then there's the way he approaches the Buddha. So although he is outwardly, the sutta tells us he's outwardly polite, but he doesn't really approach this respected, indeed revered practitioner and teacher 
in a spirit of hum humility asking for a teacher. Um, it's much more like, um, well, come on, go to me. What, what is it you teach? Uh, what's your doctrine? What is this stuff you're teaching? I don't know if you've ever had this experience, but several times in my life, a non-Buddhist has asked me, uh, well, what's, what's this Buddhism about then? And it's usually done in a circumstances where it's completely inappropriate to give any sort of response, like, you know, you're having dinner with some friends or something. Um, and you just know, when that happens, you just know this person is not asking this question because they really want to understand. They're asking this question. The spirit behind this question is a challenge. And although, as I said, the sutta says he's outwardly polite, this seems to be the spirit in which Dandapani approaches the Buddha. He asks him effectively, what is this Buddhism all about? Come on, go to it. What is your doctrine? What is your doctrine? What is it that you teach? He's almost looking for an argument. So that's the third thing about him. And then the final brushstroke, I think, in our picture of Dandapani is the very teaching that the Buddha gives him. Um, because the Buddha gears his teaching to individuals, and this is a teaching which is obviously just what Dandapani needs to hear, and it tells us a lot about him, as we'll see. So overall, we get a picture of Dandapani. He is, if you like, a grumpy old man. Um, he's a man with strong opinions, with views. Um, what the Buddha calls views, views, the Buddha calls views, opinions that are emotionally held, they're based on our emotions. And he gets into bad, he's somebody who likes disputes, he gets into bad tempered arguments with those who see things differently. He lashes out with his stick, verbally at least. There are lots of Dandapanis in our time, and by no means all of them are old. Um, there's a lot of bad-tempered conflict, bad-tempered discourse, bad-tempered disputation over views, over a whole plethora of views going on around us all the time. A general tendency to dig in behind fixed views and demonize those who hold other views rather than trying to see what might be, have some validity in the other person's point of view. See where the other person's coming from. The internet is a hotbed of Dandapaniism. Um, and the teaching that the Buddha gives to Dandapani um, is precisely aimed at this Dandapaniism. Um, so it's a sutta that's highly relevant to our times and perhaps highly relevant to us as individuals. And that teaching is very, very simple. So Dandapani asks, what is your doctrine? And the Buddha answers, my doctrine is not to get into bad tempered disputes and arguments with any sort of person whatsoever in this whole world. My teaching is that we get into conflict because we are obsessed by the way we interpret the world, which arises from our desires and our likes and dislikes. The way we interpret the world arises from our likes and dislikes. This is my doctrine. This is what I teach. Just that. Don't get into bad tempered disputes. Well, this is not what Dandapani wants to hear. Um, and he immediately stomps off. And the description of his stomping off in the sutta is great. It says he stomps off, shaking his head, wagging his tongue, raising his eyebrows. So his forehead was wrinkled into three furrows and leaning on his stick. Um, that's a great picture, I think. A great picture that tells you what he, yeah, just tells you what he was feeling. Shaking his head, wagging his tongue, raising his eyebrows so that his forehead was wrinkled into three uh, into three furrows. Um, Dandapani likes his disputatiousness. Um, so that is obviously teaching. The Buddha gives a teaching that is highly relevant to Dandapani, even though he didn't, he really didn't want to hear it. Um, and it is highly relevant to our times as well. Um, 
But it's a deceptively simple, on, 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 its, on the face of it, it's a deceptively simple teaching. And the bhikkhus who heard this exchange were a bit puzzled. Um, they wanted a bit more detail. So that evening, they asked the Buddha, well, what exactly did you mean uh, by what you said to Dandapani? Um, and I, I have to interpret this slightly. So interpreting slightly, because I don't think we really know what some of these Pali terms mean anymore. But interpreting slightly, what the Buddha replies is that if we are not ruled by our likes and dislikes, by our desires, our worldly agendas, then we won't get tangled up in what is called prapancha, mental uh, proliferation, stories, stories about what is going on, stories about what other people are doing, um, et cetera, et cetera. And if we don't get caught up in those stories, we won't get obsessed by opinions, by views. And if we aren't obsessed by views, we won't get caught up in bad tempered conflict and all the negative emotions that that arises from and all the negative emotions that that gives rise to. Um, so according to the Sutta, letting go of view, sitting light to views, would, according in the words of the Sutta, be the end of arguments, quarrels, disputes, accusations, divisive tail-bearing and false speech. Hmm. Sounds like a lot of what passes for public debate in our time, actually. Quarrels, disputes, accusations, divisive tail-bearing and false speech based on mental proliferation, stories, the views that people are obsessed with. Anyway, as I've said, I've interpreted a little bit what the Buddha says, because maybe it's not totally obvious, really, but I've interpreted, and I'm pretty sure that's, you know, that's the sort of standard, standard interpretation. Um, but the, so the bhikkhus have heard the explanation. They're not, they're not completely clear either. They're, they're still left, left scratching their heads a little. So after the Buddha has retired for the night, um, they, um, they say to each other, what did he mean? What did he mean exactly uh, about getting tangled up in propancha, mental proliferation, um, stories about the world and the way we label things? What did he mean about this coming from desires and likes and dislikes? So they said, oh, I don't know. Well, I, let's go and ask someone. Let's go and ask Mahakachana. Mahakachana. He is respected by the Buddha and he is respected by the wiser members of the Sangha. So let's go and ask him, get him to give us a bit more detail. So they find uh, Mahakachana and tell him what the Buddha said. And then they ask him, well, what did he mean? What did he mean exactly? And Mahakachana replies, I don't know why you're asking me. Um, you should have asked the Buddha himself. He's the teacher. He's the real deal. Um, why are you asking me? So the bhikkhu said, well, okay, yes, we know he's the real deal. We know he's the Lord of the Dharma and the giver of the deathless, but um, we know we should have asked him, but we didn't. So um, come on, Mahakachana, uh, you can tell us what the Buddha meant. And so please do so, please do so, without making it too difficult. Um, I love that detail, I love that detail. Tell us what the Buddha meant without making it too difficult. Maybe sometimes Mahakachana grinds a little fine. Um, maybe sometimes he makes things a bit complicated. So um, tell us what he meant without making it too difficult. So Mahakachana agrees. Um, and he explains what the Buddha meant in a lot of detail with a lot of words and a lot of repetition. He lists every sense organ in turn. Eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, mind. Every sense field in turn. Every sense object in turn. And for each of these in turn, he looks at every aspect of the perceptual situation. He talks about for each one of these, using the same words for each, he talks about how we experience pleasant or unpleasant feelings 
in response to our sense impressions. Um, he talks about um, using exactly the same words for each one. He talks about how we label or interpret our experience according to whether it's pleasant or not. Um, he talks about this way, the way this leads to desires and likes and dislikes. He talks about what the way these likes and dislikes determine the stories we tell, the propancha we get into uh, about the world and about other people. And he tells us how those stories, this mental proliferation leads to emotionally held views. And finally, he tells us how these emotionally held views lead to quarrels, disputes, accusations, divisive tail bearing and false speech. He adds a lot of words to what the Buddha said, a lot of detail, uh, but I don't think he really adds very much in the sense of extra meaning. But anyway, the monks are satisfied. Uh, maybe they're just overwhelmed by the detail. Um, that's enough, that's enough, Mahakachana, we get it. Um, anyway, they, they accept it and they go and see the Buddha and the Buddha puts his validation later on what Mahakachana said and they said, well, this is as, as sweet as a ball of honey. Anyway, this sutta, this sutta is one of a small family of suttas, discourses, that deal with how we create a mental world, a private, unreal world of mental constructions, ideas, and how we then live in that world, um, how we construct our deluded reality. So these describe how, much of it the same as Mark Achana, how on the basis of our sense impressions, we experience an immediate, I like it, I want, want it, or an immediate, I don't want it, push it away. Um, how um, we label and categorize the things that we see. So I see in front of me a, um, a, a sort of brown shape and I label that table. It's a table. Um, but someone from a completely different culture might label it uh, differently. They might think, well, no, it's not. It's a really badly constructed canoe and it's not gonna float. Or it's a bed. Um, or it's some firewood. Um, I label this a painting. Somebody else might label it a terrible mess from a different period. I don't know. Um, and of course, these two things, the, 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 the pleasant or unpleasant, I like it or I don't like it, and the labeling, they interact. There's a feedback loop between them. Um, so if I see some brown material on a table over there and I label it chocolate, I go, oh, I want it. If I label it something else, I go, oh, I don't want it. Uh, our labeling makes a big difference to our likes, and, uh, to, 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 to our immediate responses to things. But then on the basis of this labeling and this liking or disliking, this wanting to move towards or move away from, um, on the basis of what gives us pleasure and what gives us the opposite, we desire we and, and how we label things good or bad, uh, that gives rise to desires and likes and dislikes. And then on the basis of these likes and dislikes and desires, we get into propancha, mental proliferation, stories, stories about why we don't get what we like, how that lot are stopping us getting what we like. Um, about other people's motives and intentions or plots, about how the world could be more to our taste if only people would be more sensible, about um, who deserves what and who doesn't deserve what, what's fair and what's not fair. Um, all stories, what's good and what's bad, not in the ethical sense, but desirable and undesirable. And on the basis of this mental proliferation, we develop views, opinions based on our emotions and desires, our likes and our dislikes. We create the mental world from our stories, and then we live in that world um, rather than the real one. We live in a world of mental, deluded mental constructions. 
And then, I mean, there's loads of feedback loops in all of this. It's a very, very complicated to talk about in a, in a short talk, but these mental constructs, of course, feed back to other steps in the chain. Our views about the world determine what we notice in the world. So if we think everybody's out for themselves, we notice all the acts of uh, selfishness that are around us. So we don't notice the opposite, we just turn a blind eye to others. Or we dismiss them, oh, they're just doing it for themselves anyway in some sort of roundabout way. Um, and our mental constructs also determine how we label our experience, what we see as desirable, uh, uh, good or bad. As I said, I label this a really nice painting. Someone from a different era would label it quite differently. Someone with a different view of art, a different mental construct about art might label it differently. Um, some one person sees that large car and that looks a good thing to that person. It, according to their ideology, uh, it's a sign of good prosperity, abundance. To another pe person with a different ideology, it looks ridiculous, a waste of resources. Um, so we only we tend to see and label in a way that confirms our view of the world, our castle of mental constructions. And that castle of mental constructions becomes self-sustaining. Self our views and opinions become self-sustaining. And of course, this effect is turbocharged in our day because we can choose to look for our information only from places that agree with us. Um, and we can choose never to expose ourselves to sources of information that present a different worldview that might contain facts that would be inconvenient for our views. So in all those ways, this whole thing is very, very relevant to our time. Um, and that's the territory that this family of suitors deal with. And it is deep, important stuff, what these suitors deal with, because it tells us how we construct our deluded worldview from our ideas based on our likes and dislikes, how we construct a world of delusion and then live in it. But getting back to the more, as it were, down to earth message of our sutta, the Honeyball Sutta, the Buddha's message to Dandapani and to us, it's, it, that message is quite simple. Don't get into ill-tempered Ill disputes or arguments with anyone whatsoever based on views and opinions. Views and opinions arise from likes and dislikes and the mental proliferation that these give rise to. I think for our day, we could perhaps expand on that a little bit and say, well, views and opinions um, are based on, yes, our emotions, our likes and dislikes, our psychological conditioning um, with regard to, I don't know, authority and all sorts of other things. And um, what we want to be true, often views are based on what we like to be true, not what it is, uh, ideas we like and based on the tribe or the group in society that we identify with. Um, our views are not arrived at by clear logical thought, even if we think they are. Because when it comes to worldly matters, the world of space and time and matter and people and I don't know, viruses, uh, when it comes to all that, the webs of interlocked causation and conditionality are so complex that we could never be absolutely sure about anything. And we never have all the facts. We never know all the facts. <clears throat> this doesn't mean we can't be certain of anything because I think we can be certain of some spiritual values and the things that arise from that. Those are things that we know for certain with our heart. What we can't be certain of is what goes on in this mess of conditioned co-production around us. And it doesn't mean we can never disagree with people. Um, but we should, it does mean that we should never disagree in a way that ruptures the bonds of fellow feeling, the bonds of solidarity that connect us to others, the bonds of human fellow feeling. We should sit light to our stories and views, except that we may be wrong and that it's much more important to maintain meta with other people. Um, 
then accept that there may be some truth in other people's points of view. So we should never disagree in a way that disrupts, breaks our connection to others. And the Buddha was very, very clear on this. Um, so there's another sutta about a conflict in the Sangha with two groups with different views who could not be reconciled. And the Buddha called the two sides together and he told them off. He told them off in no uncertain terms. He said, you foolish men, what can you know? What can you possibly see that would lead you to stab each other with verbal daggers that you can neither convince each other nor be convinced by others. This will lead to your suffering for a long time. I think it's significant that he says, what can you know? What can you possibly see? In our unenlightened state, in this incredibly complex web of events, not knowing all the facts, how can we possibly be so certain of our views that we would cause that, cause that, that would cause us to fall out with others. Um, so we can imagine the Buddha saying that to the army of amateur political, armed, am, amateur armchair political scientists and economists and climate scientists and epidemiologists online, stabbing each other with verbal daggers. What can you possibly know? What can you possibly see that would lead you to be so sure that you are right? That you can neither be convinced by others nor convince others. I can imagine, I'm afraid, the Buddha saying this to me when I contemptuously dismiss somebody whose views that I, uh, I disagree with, as I am often tempted to do. Um, I remember once had a discussion saying, in my humble opinion, so-and-so is true. And a good friend of mine said, Vadanya, you have never had a humble opinion in your life. And that was a fair cop. That was a fair cop. Um, I have an Indadandapani, and I need to hear those words. Sometimes I need to hear the Buddha saying, what can you know, Vadanya? What can you see that you can be so sure of your opinion? Uh, that you might be tempted to stab someone with a verbal dagger. And maybe, just maybe, you also, we all, maybe you, sometimes need to hear the Buddha saying that when we dig in behind an opinion. So even in these very, very difficult times and very difficult situation where none of us is getting what we desire, where our likes and dislikes are being trampled upon by reality, as Buddhists, we don't get caught up in all the blaming and disputes about what should be done or what shouldn't be done. As Padma Vajra said last week, as Buddhists, we accept the situation for what it is and work with it without blaming. We practice. We look for things to rejoice in. We forget about all the views and opinions that are blaring at us from every side and treat this as an opportunity to leave behind our old patterns and find a new and different way better way of being. Thank you.